Happy Thursday, and it's time to get in the game. I'm telling you that if you're running a small business or thinking about uh, growing one, you don't have to get off the bench and get in the game because a quarterback has to be out on the field doing his thing. So uh, part of what we do here at the Academy is grow great quarterbacks and, and all aspects of the business you have to be involved in. Tonight we're talking about cash flow and funding, financing, and instruments that might be used to finance your business. So our objective is indeed to see that you've got a, an arrow that's headed up, and that headed up is positive cash flow, positive asset building, more and more customers, lots of raving fan customers. That's, the, that's what we want that arrow to represent for us in our business. Uh, well, I'm Steve Carver, talk, uh, sharing this uh, information with you from our office in Dunn, North Carolina. My presentation number 1025, and glad to have you on board on my journey. And thank you so much for letting me be part of your journey. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to work with y'all. You are the most imp important people in the room, and I don't want anyone ever to think different. Uh, I'm not a lawyer or a tax advisor. I'm just a fellow that's been in business a long time, and the best advice I can give you is, yeah, listen to my opinion if you'd like, but get other opinions before you make an important decision. There's no reason for you to uh, have a, a risk in not having enough information because there's a lot of folks that will help you if you just ask. Tonight we are sponsored by the Small Business Center in Sampson County, North Carolina, at Sampson Community College. It's a fantastic school there, which we're glad to be a part of. I don't think I played a Bart's message for you. Let's listen to Bart Rice, who is our uh, our sponsor. Let's see what he's got to say. I work in a small business center. Basically what this is, is something that was created about 30 years ago, and it was designed to help people start uh, small businesses or improve a small business that they've already started. Well, a lot of times they either seek me out or they refer to me by somebody else. They're coming you know, because they don't have any idea on how to start a small business. So what I do is I take, uh, listen to them, and take their ideas and any dreams they might have had, or just, you know, the things that they had thought about when they were working a mundane, regular day job. And I help them kind of put it, put a real stamp on it. Um, I listen, give some guidance, and try, try to push them in the right direction uh, in order to succeed. Well, that's, that's the best thing about the Small Business Center. It's Everything is no cost. We do the confidential um, appointments that we have, uh, counseling appointments, and we also do seminars. And uh, they kind of build help them learn the skills that they're going to need to succeed in small business today. And all of that's at no cost. Fantastic, Mark. We know you're doing a great job. And anyone that uh, would like to get an appointment, go ahead and give them a call or send an email, get it set up. He'd just love to hear from you. And uh, uh, we're so thankful for his support uh, for all the entrepreneurs that we work with. It's getting that season uh, where your homework is becoming more and more important if you want to earn the certificates. So pay attention to your homework. If there's any of these items that you just can't do, uh, let me know that if you're facing some issues that's keeping you from doing something because we want you to uh, win your certificates. And uh, Serena and I want to get them printed up and send them to you. So let me know if there's a certain problem you're having. We'll work through it to come up with some alternatives. Um, make sure you're using your chat button to ask questions, talk to each other, uh, ask me for study guides or appointments, and we'll take it from there. Uh, I'll try to answer anything on the chat button uh, before the close of business the next day. Tonight, you, know, you should have uh, three handouts that were sent to you. If you didn't, ask me to send them to you, and I will after the program. Uh, number 1025, our presentation number is uh, the talking points that we'll be using tonight. 40 drill skills are very important. Uh, they'll be a major part of your uh, quiz that we uh, do some each week, and also a handout on some borrowing tips. <clears throat> you know that every time y'all send me some information, I take it very seriously, and uh, you do use it as a teaching point so that 
we can all help each other. My job is to be assertive and to help motivate and encourage y'all, so I'm very happy to do it. Uh, this afternoon, Penny uh, in uh, Wilmington, our resident redhead, told us that uh, she was going to be busy last night and tonight, but she uh, wanted to make sure to send us some work so she, <clears throat> we would know that she's been busy, and I'm so glad to hear from her. Uh, she, for one, is uh, getting her office ready to make videos. She said she just didn't feel good about the way it looked because she wants good background and wants those videos to be first class, so she's working on her office to do that. She's working on her DBAs, uh, uh, putting down some different names, planning on some more items to add as profit centers. Uh, she's almost ready to get her LLC, but uh, concerned about what the name might be. Uh, she's uh, looking around town and talking to people about finding some locations that she might have uh, uh, set up her displays uh, to handle sales and to be able to send customers to if she don't want to send them to her house, and we certainly understand that. But maybe the biggest use, she got her uh, My Business on Google account set up today and uh, or, th or this week, and I am just so pleased with her. But let's just take a look at that. So I, as soon as she told me, I went and checked it out. Uh, when I type in Resin Redhead, I get a good uh, uh, view of her uh, of her work that she's doing with lots of photos. So proud of her. got her map up there. Now, she's just starting to load this, and uh, loading your uh, business on Google account is a free website that you can put your photos there and messages and different landing pages. So if you're not taking advantage of Google My Business, you're missing a big, big lick. So let me encourage you to do that. It's so important. It's basically free. To, uh, if you, if you, it's just like having a, a really powerful website. You know when you're on Google and you're searching for something and you write it in and, and, you, and you, you tap on images to see pictures of what it was you tapped in the, on your search terms? Those pictures that come up all across the United States, those pictures come up and are collected from uh, the, the uh, My Business on Google accounts just like this one. So uh, Penny may have her jewelry being shown in all over the United States, the West Coast, the Northeast. Uh, New Orleans, just because she's got those photo photos uh, on her Google My Business account. So this is really powerful. So uh, please do it for your own benefit. It will really help you. It does help me. Uh, here's some of the photos that uh, are on that account. So you can put large ones and small ones. Uh, notice that she's got prices listed on them and just lots of information. Fall in love with, with My Business on Google because it will bring you dividends back. It is a great, great marketing tool. And lo and behold, let me tell you that I noticed just after a little bit as I was watching uh, that on Penny's account, someone gave her a five-star review. And isn't that just amazing? Uh, this afternoon she got her first five-star review, and that's the way to kick it off and get started, no doubt. Why is that so important? Anyone that's never heard of you before, is, or just stumbles across your website for one reason or another, the very minute they see that you're getting five-star reviews, that automatically tells them that you are uh, maintaining good standards, you got somebody that believes in you, and it's so much better than seeing a one-star or a two-star or a three-star. It's just a good shot in the arm by doing that. Now, I happen to know personally the one that gave her that five-star review uh, because it was <laughs> it was me. And I'll encourage you guys right now to go to Penny's website and just brag on her for the great girl she is and for the great woman she is and getting started on business. Uh, we need to help each other as members of the Academy uh, promote uh, these websites where that we can give good reviews to help each other move along. Uh, I've, I've got every confidence in the world that if you're paying attention here that you'll be giving your customers good service. So think about that. And uh, let's have some fun with this. If y'all don't mind, write down Resin Redhead, and when you type that into Google uh, search, you'll come up with this and, and uh, uh, give some comments about uh, what a great business lady that, that uh, Penny is and looking forward to uh, watching her business grow. Good reviews go a long way. And secondly, the same thing, we can do it for Vanessa is with us tonight. Hey, Vanessa, glad to have you here again. 
I've been very loyal. We've been working with Vanessa on her videos this week. But while I was doing that, I had a chance to spend some time on her website, which she does herself. And we learned just this afternoon, breaking news, Vanessa will also help you build your website. Fantastic news. And what I was struck with was how patriotic her homepage is. I think I counted last night 12 different uh, flags uh, uh, here, and this, this is a clear message that Vanessa and her family are patriots, uh, love America, and she proudly sells products that are made in America, which is a big, big deal. So, uh, so thank you so much for your patriotism. And while I was looking there, I noticed that Vanessa had a chat a chat option. And, and I've been kind of thinking about that for a lot of years, but Vanessa moved me into saying, well, you know what, maybe I, it's time for me to get that at carverequipment.com. So today I started the process talking with my webmaster about how I can put chat at, uh, at my website. She said if she does your website for you, that she can automatically just work it right in, no problem at all. So uh, we'll see how that works, and I'll report to you next week how I'm coming along with my chat program. But Vanessa also has her business at Google, uh, my business on Google. She's got a great little website there. She's doing it all. She's getting five-star reviews. I certainly gave her a good one, too. So if you all want to go to Five Alarm Logistics, LLC, and uh, her, uh, my business on Google account to come up, give her some good reviews that'll help all of us at the academy. Uh, here's a sample of what reviews look like. A great experience for, uh, with products. Uh, just uh, my experience with Vanessa is really good. You can uh, say good things and give that five-star review, and it'll help a lot of people, no doubt about it. So Vanessa, good work. Looking forward to working with you. Hopefully. Uh, one of my virtual assistants, Maddie, is uh, working on reworking one of your videos, and we'll be able to show everybody the different uh, bells and whistles we can put into them next week. What especially uh, uh, moved me also in talking with Vanessa, she's kind of ahead of the game. Did y'all notice, or any of you watched the Super Bowl this past weekend, for the first time, every ad on the Super Bowl had had a, a QR code on it. And I'm telling you, my friends, if those folks that are spending zillions of dollars per 30-second commercials think the QR codes are important, then, hey, let's, let's just go ahead and wake up and accept the fact we need to start using them as well. For 10 years, we, uh, QR codes have been around, and I've seen the uh, real estate market really go big for them. I've seen the used car uh, dealerships really go big for them. But now we're seeing pretty much everything. If you are going to send out uh, emails that people can have on their phone or see on their TV or publications, uh, and you want people to come right straight to a landing page, a QR code is a very effective way to do it. So how can we help people find uh, find us? Uh, uh, is One good way is with the QR code. So how much does it cost to use a QR code? Zip, nothing. Nothing at all. You just go to Google, type in QR codes, and uh, a place to come right to you, and you tell them uh, the website or the link that you want that you want a code for, and it will automatically give it to you. And you can copy and paste it, and use it just like any other photo, and interject it anywhere you want to. I'm seeing these on the back of automobiles. I'm seeing them on sign on signs on the side of cards. Seeing them on billboards. QR codes uh, really took a major leap uh, this past week because the Super Bowl basically said they are here and it's time that people start using them, and so let's take the message and get on with it. Yep, I'm still trying to be assertive and try to help motivate and encourage you. That's what I'm supposed to do, and I am wide open doing it, so keep on keeping on. You're doing a great job. The key that you, you have to do is to stay in the game. Keep plugging. Keep doing something every day, no matter how big or how small. You got to pace yourself to find the endurance to do it. Now, last week I started uh, mentioning, and I want to do it again this time, because uh, we need to have a part of our uh, DNA in thinking about marketing, something that will help you tremendously. And I have failed to mention it before. I apologize for that. Is that when we're looking at our 
uh, profit centers, the things that we plan to earn income with, I want you to have a mix there of not only type one, two, and three type profit centers, but maybe and more important is the two kinds of uh, profit centers that everyone will use. One is people are out here buying things they want. Don't really need them, can get along with them, can wait another day or two, might even wait the rest of their life. They don't really need this thing, but they want it, and they're going to buy it if they got some extra money. And usually when we have those kind of things as our profit centers, we're able to make a, a, a little bit better profit on them. We sure do. Uh, people pay more for them. They don't not quite as, as stingy when they're buying. But what we tend to forget is we must have items that we're selling to keep our business alive are things that people really need, need. Like if you've got a little infant baby, you need baby formula. You need uh, diapers. You've got to have stuff, and no matter how the economy is, up or down, we'll figure out a way to buy that baby formula, right? And if you're into your pets, if you're into your dogs and your cats, you will find a way to buy some cat food or some dog food. Now, maybe you won't buy the really expensive stuff that you want, but you'll find something to feed those animals that you love, right? So as we're designing our business plans and our marketing plans, let's try to have things in here that people will need as well as things that people will want. Because those things that people need and, uh, and, that, and you can get them buying from you on a regular basis, repeat business time after time, you're probably not going to make a lot of profit on each one of those items. But the volume will make up for it to help you have good cash flow, and that's what it's about tonight is cash flow. Plus, if you've got them coming into your store to buy the milk, bread, uh, 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 orange juice type products that people uh, need and will have to have, while they're there, you're going to be able to say, and by the way, yeah, remember my three favorite words, by the way, you need products there that are bringing people in so you can say, and by the way, and then you can sell them some things that maybe they want if they've got some money to do it. This is an important lesson I want to encourage each and every one of you to do. Look at what you're offering to sell and see if you can add something to that product line that is something people need and will come to you day after day or week after week, very repetitive business, and that will help your uh, cash flow. Now, look here. These guys are looking nice, but you know what? They're just spectators. They're just sitting back, not taking any risk, not breaking any sweat, not getting their hair messed up, not getting their fingernails dirty. They're not in the game. They're spectators, and to make things happen, you have to be a player. Now, I asked each one of you tonight as you were coming on board, if you'd had a good week, what you've been doing to help your business. I want you always to be able to say, I'm, I'm right where I'm pacing myself, but I'm getting where I want to be. I am a player, Steve. I am a player. I'm making things happen, and at my pace, I'll get to where I need to go. I will be in the game. So tonight, my job is to talk to us about the, the basic fundamentals that are uh, not very exciting but absolutely necessary is cash flow, uh, funding, fundraising, and loan documents are going to be the, uh, our main topics tonight. Bread and butter, business administration's item. So we all at some point in time have to say, where can I find the money to get my business started? Where can I find the money to take this next step I need to take? Where can I find the money to buy my website? So, Vanessa, let me encourage you right now to give some thought to creating a menu that you could offer to someone that's just getting their business started and basically what the cost will be to help them be online with a 10 or 12-page website that covers the basics there and uh, and, and have a a an introductory quotation to get people started. So that's that'll be the first step that you'll want to do in getting started with that. Because when people are looking at money to get their business started, especially if they attend these uh, webinars here, 
we know that at some point we don't have to go online. So where is the help in hand that you need to find the money? Where is it? And I'll tell you, it's probably at the end of your own arm. That'll be the first step that we find it. We are not going to be able to to, to uh, pretend that there's people waiting in line out there just to shove money down our throat. We know that's not the case. Uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, uh, you can get grants here and grants there. The, the fact of the matter is there are a few grants out there, but they are very few for, for, for profit businesses. There are more grants out there for nonprofit businesses, but for profit, as all of y'all have mentioned, very few grants aboard. But the good news is your business, your small business center, it is their job, it's their responsibility to know if there are any of those grants out there in the world and how to put you in touch with them. So that's another reason that you might want to make an appointment at the small business center. Now we all have our hands, the hand that we're dealt. We're, we're, in, a, we're in a heck of a game of poker here. And some of you may have a, a royal flush in your hand. Some of you may not even have a pair. Uh, and whatever our hand is, we're going to play it because we need to be move our entrepreneur roll down the road. So a lot of us maybe have started out with zip or minus zip, where not only you didn't have any money to start, but you didn't have anybody encouraging you to go there. Well, I know I encourage you to go there, and we'll try to figure out how to make it happen for you. But the facts are, for businesses to get some startup money, to, to, to borrow it, uh, or to get grants, is going to be very hard. But with special considerations, and, and if you are a promising entrepreneur startup business, maybe indeed you can get some loans if you cover certain bases I don't cover tonight. Number one, what? how do we define promising? Number one is your credit worthiness. Do you have a credit history, and is it a good credit history? If you're very young or haven't ever borrowed any money or got anything started, not having a credit history is just as bad as, as uh, uh, well, first of all, it's a non-starter. So uh, the lenders want to see some history there, and none of them want to be the first one to take a chance. However, maybe to, uh, to, for you to be promising, maybe you got a good down payment to make. Maybe you're going to make a personal investment to get this business started, or someone's going to help you, uh, give you some money to get it started. And that's called that you having skin in the game. How much personal investment do you have in it? It's hard to ask the lender to put their money into business if you're not willing to put yours in there. Another important factor is uh, maybe to help you along, is do you have some tangible collateral items that you might offer to secure the loan? That is, put some collateral up there uh, to say to the lender, I'm willing to back my uh, application up with this collateral, and if, if I don't pay you, then the collateral is yours, and you can sell it to get your money out of it. So that's, that could be a really strong thing. Maybe you have some real estate that's deeded to you or, or uh, some uh, vehicles, or uh, who knows what. Uh, any way you can add collateral to the game will make it important. Maybe you have some family members that have some extra collateral that they might be able to shift over to you and let you use it to secure a loan. That happens a lot. It can go a long way. A borrower uh, should have a good wide vision and grasp all the issues that are related to a business loan. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit. Just because you can get a loan don't mean that you can understand the ramifications of getting a business loan. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, when you're getting that uh, loan and you're doing that loan preparation, uh, you need to be perfectly honest on that because you're selling yourself and you're selling your honesty right there. So make sure filling out that application, you don't play any games, games with it. You want to have a business plan. So we can provide you through the academy and the small business centers uh, the help to write your business plan. Now, it don't have to be real big and real complicated. The reason you want that business plan is to show the lender that you've given a lot of thought about how this business is going to work and uh, what the uh, risks are and the risk management, what it's going to take to make a profit, how much uh, volume you need to sell of different things. 
uh, to help them understand that you're going to make enough money not only to keep the business alive, but to pay them back, and plus, hopefully, to have some profit left over for yourself. You need to understand that whether it's an, a, a loan to a corporation, a business or not, <clears throat> you're still going to be on the line personally. All small business loans are signed by people that sign as president, and then they sign as individuals. So don't think that you can go to the bank and borrow money and not be on the hook for it yourself if things go south. That's why it's so hard to get a loan. Your personal guarantee, that's another document, your personal guarantee will be attached to that loan, which says everything you've got from your toothpaste to your uh, toothbrush and your chainsaw will be tied up uh, until this loan is paid back. That's called a blanket lien, and that's pretty much always asked for when an entrepreneur gets a first-time loan. As you stay in business 50 years, <laughs> it might lighten up, and you'll develop relationships with lenders and credit lines with lenders where you don't have to jump through all these hoops. But generally, always, you don't have a certain rigid structure that you don't have to stay with between. Yeah, you might own your own business, and maybe you might be your own boss, but you'll have to answer to the people that you owe money to, and that they'll hold you, hold you right to the fire. How, how do we answer to them better? One, remember always connecting the dots. If we're always making decisions that make good sense and we, we show uh, our, our lender how we're running our business, if we've made those decisions that make good sense and our business ball is rolling along pretty good, that's going to help you. If you show the lender and that, that you understand that if you don't repay this loan, that it's really going to affect you for a long, long time, and jeopardize your personal history on pretty much everything you can do in the future, business and money-wise. That's a big risk, and you need to be really focused on that. And you want to know and show your lender that you understand about risk management. Remember, we've been talking about that since night one, and this is this circle that I keep talking about. We're, we talked about risk management back then, and we're going to talk about it tonight. It's all connected in a big round circle. You, you're going to know your risk management tools and, and, uh, and, and be willing to talk to them and show what you're doing to protect yourself. Because when you're protecting yourself, you're protecting their loan and your ability to pay them back. How about your business skills? Are you cool? Are you cool with selling? Do you know how to sell? Uh, do you know how to order, uh, forecast? Do you know how to make these products? Uh, do, you, do you understand how to train employees? Do you have marketing skills? This is going to be really important in the, in the lender's eyes, and they will ask you questions related to that. And when you can show them that you've been through our class and you've got this certificate, and even if you want a letter from me uh, uh, recommending you and, and, and uh, uh, certifying that you have this training, I'll be glad to do it. And you know what? Sometimes that's the kind of things that, that push you over the top. Now, uh, developing that comprehensive business plan with a marketing plan to back it up, like the last two weeks we've been talking about marketing so strong, and now you're going to be able to put down a plan, uh, show them everything right down to that magic marketing moment, uh, that will impress the lender. It will make a big difference because a lot of people just don't know. A lot of people just don't know what you're learning in these classes. I don't care if they've got three or four college educations. What we're teaching here at the Small Business Center and in these classes is street smart stuff, things that will really make a difference in your ability to keep a business going in good times and bad times. So, again, uh, we're happy to help you right here, as is your Small Business Center. Oh, my grace is alive. Uh, sometimes we just get down in the dumps. We want to move forward. We just don't have the money to get there, ready to rock and roll. Well, let me tell you, uh, maybe you got the, the, the need startup money blues. Well, let me show you how to get out of those blues. Maybe maybe we break a piggy bank. You got a piggy bank with right much cash in it? That may help you get started. You know, most of us can start this business with uh, two or $3,000 
really just the basics, getting started one step at a time. And that sounds like a lot of money if you don't have any. But with certain ways of fundraising, certain ways of fundraising, you can get the money you need to get started one step at a time, and then let's start making the money and pay you way as you go. Uh, uh, Hewlett Packard, as big a company as that was, it got started in a garage in California by, by two fellows that didn't even have a full-time job. Uh, uh, good businesses can start small and really grow and grow from there. Uh, maybe you got some money or your, one of your relatives does keeps your money in the freezer that will loan it to you. My Aunt Myrtle used to keep her money in the freezer, and she'd take us on vacation in the summertime, my brother and I. And when we asked her for some money to go buy uh, some ice cream or a soft drink or do something at the pavilion, she'd hand us some cash, and you could smell it. You could smell that freezer odor on it. We used to call that Aunt Myrtle's cold cash. But that's where she kept her money. She didn't put it in the bank. She kept her extra money right in that freezer. And uh, when she needed it, she could get it. Some people keep their money out in the yard, buried in basin jars. Uh, up to just a few years ago when lots of your baby, uh, your uh, folks that survived the Depression in the 20s, those folks that uh, lived through that and lost their money in all the banks, they didn't put their money back in the bank. They put it under the pillow, under the mattress, put it in a mason jar and buried it out in the yard. Do I know this for a fact? I do. Because I wouldn't be sitting here tonight and my business wouldn't be here if my grandmother, Granny Carver, uh, didn't go out in her yard to her special place and dug up a, a, a hole in, in the ground and pulled a mason jar out that she had $3,000 in there, cash money, dirty money, I guess you would call it, $3,000. She loaned it to my daddy. Uh, he started the business. Uh, he took out $3,000 of borrowed money from, from his mother, and we got our business started. Today, to start the same business, he probably needs $6 million. It's amazing how things have changed. But you can still start a business today. Most of you, what you're all talking about doing, can take $3,000 and get wide open in just a few months. So I'm excited to be able to tell you that. Other ways maybe you can turn some some uh, 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 trash into treasure is look around at what people have uh, that you might be able to talk them into giving you to sell it. Or if you sell it for them, share the money. Or you go out and clean up uh, through the woods at your uncle's or aunt's houses or someone you know, look through garages, uh, do the yard sale type thing. Uh, it is amazing how much money can be made at these sales, uh, private sales, on weekends. Let me tell you. You gather up five hundred dollars worth of stuff for six weeks, then you've got three thousand bucks. Yeah. The key is don't go sell something on Saturday afternoon and spend it Saturday night. You need to put it in your mason jar and hold on to it to help get your business started. It's like uh, four wheelers and old motorcycles and tools and trailers. Uh, uh, maybe you or some of your family or or you know a place that somebody might just give you this stuff to clean it up or give it to you if you'll give them half of what the sale brings. Don't be so proud of yourself that you can't do some work. Don't feel like you're too good to make money because in the years that you'll spend running your own business, you're going to be surprised what we end up doing sometimes to save our business or to make it grow. <laughs> I've done it all through the years. I know it for a fact, and I love it. And uh, so I, I know this can work, and I've helped so many people get their businesses started. And what I would love for you to do is to have your business started and not have one penny worth of debt. Now, there's some businesses you just can't do that with, but there's a lot that you can, so I'm not encouraging you to do that. The easiest, fastest, most profitable way to raise money is to have a fundraiser. And by golly, you can have you you can have a fundraiser to help get your business started. You can have a joint fundraiser with a nonprofit group to help them and help you. You can have a fundraiser sponsored at your church, and uh, let ask the church to let you use their facilities to have this fundraiser. And you you and you say I don't give the church a percentage of this money, but the other percentage is going to our business, or put up a tent in your backyard or use your uncle's barn 
uh, put up a shelter, and by golly, have have a good old chicken or barbecue or spaghetti fundraising dinner on a Saturday night where you're selling plates from ten to twelve dollars a piece, and bring in a couple of hundred people, two or three thousand dollars. You do that three times during the summer, you got six thousand dollars for your business. It is a great way to do that. Uh, spaghetti dinners seem to be the most profitable and. Kids love spaghetti, no doubt. Uh, uh, chicken, uh, that cook, cook, on a pig cooking grill, you can cook about 100 chickens at one time. Uh, take some slaw and some baked beans, and you got a meal that you can sell the heck out of and sell plates to. Now, here's the best part of the story. When you get started with this plan and start selling tickets, you'll have people that love you, that are really supporting you. They'll give you the chicken. Other people give you the paper products. Some folks will give you a case of, of, of baked beans. I'll tell you right now that if any one of you uh, uh, ladies that are on board here with us tonight decide to do a fundraiser, I'll make a significant contribution to buy something that you can offer to other people free. And I'll be very proud to do that. And you know what? There's a lot of other folks that will do the same thing for you. So at the end of the day, when you sell that ticket, all of it is profit almost. You can, you can actually move it that way if you put your fundraiser together the right way. Now, for over 35 years, I've been helping people uh, put on fundraisers. I was, I've been a, the president of the local PTA <laughs> with as many children as I have. I guess I've had 14, 14 or more years of being president, 10 or more years of being treasurer, and done all the fundraisers through all the years with the PTA and the Scout groups, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, American Legion, VFW fundraisers, Shrine Club, and the Masonic Lodge. I've done a lot of fundraising and proud of those times because we're helping people every time we do it. So I put together a little organizational chart that I could share with folks that have been used by many, many dozens of people, and I call it the dozen doers. Here's the way you can put together a fundraiser yourself. The key is is to find 12 people that will help you. If you can't find 12, then we'll use 10. And if you had not got 10 friends, you need to stop what you're doing, just go out tomorrow and start making friends. Because it's your friends that's going to do business with you because your enemies are going to do business with someone else. But you list down, and this is in your handout, you list down the different jobs that need to be done. Give everybody a different job to do. Ask them to get, get excited with you and go for it. Ask them to help you uh, uh, sell the first tickets that go out. And you know what? These 10 to 12 people will become your first raving fan customers because they don't feel like they got a part, an interest in what you're trying to do. And maybe your business is already up and running. Well, you can use this to help other people. Use it any way you like to help people have fundraisers and they get in a bind or have some questions. I'm always glad to talk to them about it. So, Get folks to do different parts, from setting up the chairs to cooking and prep. Uh, running a silent auction is a good way to, to raise money uh, that you don't have any investment in. Uh, have hospitality greeters, someone to clean up and uh, empty the trash, on and on. But I don't want you, I don't want you to be part of this dozen. I want you to be able to float around, help if someone gets in a jam, you can help somebody else pull it through. But the key is for you to have a team that feels like they're working as a team and, 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 and enjoying it and having a good time uh, making it happen. Uh, last night I had on board a lady that uh, 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 I had the privilege of helping her family raise uh, do a fundraiser. We used this exact same uh, group and was able to, to uh, raise over $25,000 on one Saturday night uh, uh, the, the to help pay out some medical issues. And that's cool when you can do that. I know you can. Uh, it took us six weeks to organize it. A lot of people got involved, but we started with 12 people, and those 12 people went out and found lots of other people that got involved. I know this works. I also know that because lenders are kind of tough to get along with, for me and you and these other folks, our friends that are coming along starting businesses, there's a good chance we don't have to fund it right out of our pocket. And if we need extra money, we're probably going to find it from our family and our friends. Well, this uh, slide indicates family, friends, and fools. 
Well, what I don't want to be a part of is making anyone that's trying to help you feel like a fool. So I don't spend a little time here talking about, yes, it's good. It's nothing wrong with, with uh, getting your startup money from family and friends, but you do it the right way. You, you treat this loan as if you were working with a financial institution. You take it serious. This is not a joke like when you were a child and you went up to granddad and said, granddaddy, can I borrow this? Five dollars from you to go do this or that, or can I borrow this to go do this or that? Well, he'd give it to you and give you a hug and a smile to go with it. But we all know that wasn't a loan; that was a gift. Well, maybe they want to give you a gift, but I also want, I want you to borrow money from them, and it's because that is a good place that you can establish some credit. Uh, we're gonna use your document. You're going to document everything, when the money is supposed to be paid back, and you're going to pay it on time, and you're going to be so proud of yourself when you do, and your family's going to be so proud of you when you pay off the debt. You know what they're going to say? Well, thank you. This is great. I made some good interest here. Uh, uh, how much more do you need today? Let's do it again. They will want to do it again, and you will take them up on it because you're building a credit history with them. The key is is to use promissory notes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, have collateral on board. Uh, I do not suggest that you borrow money from family and friends for more than two years. One or two years at a time is just fine. Keep everything above board. Pay it off in time. Make sure you do it. Uh, and, and, and then if, uh, if they offer or if you need, maybe you'll get you another little loan to help push you through. I hope you won't need it. But if you do uh, and you've paid it off, it'll be there for you. Now, everything related to doing business the right way says it needs to be documented. Everything that goes downhill and all the family squabbles that you get into or he said and she said or I didn't understand it that way or he's changing the terms or she's adding in this thing here. The way to get rid of all that mess is to have a document. And way back since uh, the Dark Ages in Europe, people have been using what is called a promissory note. I promise to pay back. I promise you on a note. I'm going to write it down, a promissory note, where you make a promise to pay back money that's loaned to you, where you itemize what you're buying and how much money you're getting. You definitely identify who it is that's loaning to you the money and when and how and where are you supposed to pay it back. So you've got a document that covers all the bases and it takes out all, all the BS that people uh, who are trying to score them out of an obligation will always pull out on you. It, the document even handles uh, what happens if it goes into default or goes south. It can be written out on hand just like I'm showing you on these slides. It makes it perfectly legal as long as everything's spelled out. You cover all the bases when you do it. However, there's no reason to write it out now because promissory notes are available to you online at every lawyer's office, at every banker's lawyer's, at every real estate broker's office. Promissory notes is the document that is used worldwide to loan money and pay money back. Now, it may have some other titles, but the fine print are all going to be doing what we're talking about here. It might be called a security note or uh, or, a, or a pay any day loan or, or different types of plans. But the objective here is to have spelled out what the deal is. So whether you're dealing with the banker or whether you're dealing with your Aunt Jenny or whether you're dealing with Cousin Bob, put it in writing and be a business person. Put it in writing and make sure everything's spelled out because understandings on paper help you avoid misunderstandings down the road. So you look the document over, maybe you've seen them before, but it's important that you know I'm showing this for two reasons. One, maybe because you're just getting your business started, you are on the borrowing side. You're on the side of this document where you are the, you are the, uh, uh, the debtor. But in a few years, my friends, I don't be happy to tell you, uh, you stay in business, you play your cards right, you make some money, and you're going to be in the position to loan other people money. And loaning money is a good way to make money, provided you know how to use these documents properly. So this can work for us both ways. 
And once you start uh, going out and, and getting in the business world, uh, every time you sign a document, I want you to keep this in mind. Who wrote this document? And the writer of this document, who are they most interested in? So if a, if a lawyer is preparing a loan document where you're borrowing money and the lawyer is, is working for the lender, then rest assured that he's going to write that document to favor the lender. And that's why you should read it very carefully or have someone that's used to dealing with documents read it very carefully because some things can just be taken out. Some things can be marked through. Some things just are not acceptable. And because it's on paper doesn't mean you don't have the ability to negotiate. If I don't give you a more important lesson the rest of my life and yours, listen to this. Just because someone went, went to the trouble to prepare a loan document or any type of agreement doesn't mean you have to give up your ability to negotiate because it's just a piece of paper. It's just words until everybody signs off on it. So don't be forced in or pressured into or kind of, I have felt through the years sometimes maneuvered into going somewhere I didn't want to do because the document was already prepared and I didn't feel like I could challenge it. Well, you are a better business person. You are a better entrepreneur and a more respected, a more respected business person when you do say, I need to take a little time and read this, make sure I understand it, and see if there's any changes we need to make on it. Uh huh? Right then, you, your status, your value went up with whoever you were talking to. It didn't go down. It went up. Anyone that's worth their salt in the business world will appreciate someone saying, I need to look at this kind of carefully. I am planning on paying it back. If I'm obligated not on pay it, I'm planning on it. Let me look it over and see if everything looks squared away. And, you know, maybe we need to make a change or two here or there. We can talk about that. That is a good thing to say, my friends. Remember that. You can tell them Papo Steve told you that. Now, signing that document, it makes it's legal when, when you sign it and the other person signs it. But it is just barely legal. And when I say that, legal to stand up in a court of law. And if things go south and it's an important document and there's a lot of money involved, where is it going to end up? It's going to end up at magistrate court or in civil court. So that's why we need to do some other things that is worth the time every time to make it legal. One is you want the signatures notarized. A notary public in the state of North Carolina is an officer of the court. And when you swear to them you are who you say you are and show them identification, then they will notarize the document. That doesn't mean they're saying to the world that I understand this document or this is a good deal or everything is okay with the wording on this document. No, not at all. So you don't need to think that's the case. The notary signs it not to say it's a good document and you're safe here. The notary signs it only to verify that you are who you say you are and that's your signature. That's all that notary is all about. So be careful because you might have had stuck in the back of your mind that that notary wouldn't notarize a document that I was getting screwed in. Or that notary would definitely never would notarize a document that someone's taking advantage of me or charging me way too much interest or they got some stipulations in here that just aren't fair. The notaries don't do that for you. As a matter of fact, it's against the law for them to do it for you. They are only to verify your signature. That's why you need to take it on yourself before you get out here in the business world and start signing a bunch of documents that you understand them and you have somebody read with you, so maybe uh, they'll show you the do's and the don'ts on the first one. The next time you'll understand, you can move on on your own. This is a big deal for new entrepreneurs. So uh, that's why I'm spending the time on it. So once the notary has signed it, that still doesn't mean it'll hold up in court. You need to do something that's called perfecting the lien, which, is, which makes it legal. 
a loan document or a lien document that is perfected is one that has been taken to the register of deeds in the county where the business was done and made sure that it is recorded as soon as possible. Recorded means it goes into a book that the whole public world can come and look at if they want to. It goes into a book that's related to the people who signs its names, uh, so that it's kind of recorded under both of them's names to show what the document was. If it's real estate, it goes in the deeds book, where it actually shows the deeds and the history of land transactions or, or, or houses and lots and things. But the register of deeds is a very important part of the business life for people that's dealing in, uh, in loan documents. Now, notice that I said as soon as possible, because the sooner you get your document registered, that date becomes critical because your document or your loan will be paid off in a uh, before any other documents that are there that are recorded after you in case the loans went south. Now, that's to say that let's say uh, someone went around and and uh, was selling uh, some property for five thousand dollars, and uh, uh, you bought it uh, uh, from them, and they gave you a lien on some uh, on some collateral or, or or whatever it was, but it was for five thousand dollars. That's how much your lien is. Well, they went off and sold uh, that that property and put in uh, and, and and didn't pay off the debt. Didn't pay you off your debt. Not only did they do this to you, but they did it to 20 other people. In other words, they they collected several thousands, uh, twenty, forty thousand dollars on the item that they sold and kept the money that they had lost, that they had uh, got from everybody. So you go now to get your five thousand dollars back, and because your was the first one, your lien was the first one that was registered. Uh, the the property sold for five thousand dollars. You get every penny of your money back. But the twenty people standing behind you, who had a document that looked exactly like yours, except their date was later than yours, they don't get a penny. Hmm, that's tough. Does stuff like that really happen? It happens all the time. So if you're buying an item and you want to make sure that someone else doesn't already have a lien on it, then you need to go to the register of deeds and and see what the register of deeds can tell you about that partic particular piece of real estate or automobile or that individual that's selling it to you. Because you may find out that this is not a good deal. They are selling mortgage property, which is against the law. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, you want to lend some money uh, or you want to borrow some money to help launch your business. I want you to know that, that uh, finding a right financial partner, uh, partner is very, very important. But there's negatives and positives in these relationships that we find ourselves getting into business with. Know right now that it's got a better chance of going south than it does of going north or work it out. So we're going to be real careful with anybody that we're talking about going into business with as a financial partner. Banks are just going to loan you the money. They're not going to become your financial partner. And there's several different groups of them. There's a community-based bank, like in Dunn, North Carolina here. That would be our first federal loan that's owned locally and managed locally. And then you've got your larger banks that in every town that would be your first bank and your UCB and uh, some of those banks. And then the credit unions are lending a lot of money. They're the uh, uh, state employees and Navy Federal and on and on and on. Let's stop right there for just a moment. <clears throat> credit unions may be where you would go to get a loan because that's where you got your house financed or your car financed, and that's just fine. But credit unions by law in North Carolina are not supposed to loan any money as a business loan. 
They're not in the business loan business. That's how they get some special uh, benefits. So if that's where you're going to end up going, on your application, you need to forget about mentioning anything about starting a business. You just need to talk about maybe you're going to do some special projects around the house. Because if you just if you tell them this is, you don't use it to start a business, then they're, by law they don't have to say we can't do it. But if you mention that you're handling projects or you're doing some special things, or you just steer away from talking about business at all, uh, but maybe you don't, you might say I'm going to develop my hobby, <laughs> okay, or build an outside building. Don't tell them you're calling in an office or a shop. At any rate. If you mention business to the credit union, it's going to spoil your deal. Then there's government agencies that might help you, like the Small Business Administration and some others. Private organizations are out there, and pretty much every county might have some private organizations. And I'll mention to you right here that pretty much every uh, small business center knows who the private organizations that help entrepreneurs are in their area. So that would, might be a place that you could do. Now, these are not grants, but these possibly could be some low-interest loans. And then there's angel investors. Angel investors are individuals. How do you know how to find them? Generally, when you go up and look at the board of directors of the banks in your community, and how, how do you find them? Every bank's got a website, and they generally list who their board of directors are. Those people that are the board of directors are the folks that's got deep pockets and big, big deposits within those banks. That's how they get on the board of directors with their big deposits. But we all know that the banks aren't paying very much in interest. So anyone that's a board of director of a bank has money in a bank that is doing very poorly interest-wise, and they would have a generally good interest in loaning a good entrepreneur some money. They'd want to earn it at, at rates above bank rates, and they should because they're taking a risk, taking the money out of the bank. But angel investors sometimes will let you not have to jump through all the hoops and hollers that the institutions do. They might be friends and families that you might know. Maybe you don't know any, but here's the key. Maybe you know somebody that does know somebody. This business about funding a small business is all about who you know, not what you know. It's who you know. So think in terms of maybe uh, who these directors are. Maybe you have some people that can help build a bridge between you that you can talk to them about what you're doing in your business and kind of what we call grease the tracks a little bit for you. I want you to keep in mind that angel investors, uh, they're not angels. They're investors. We call them angels because that's what they seem to us after everyone else has turned us down. But sometimes angel investors want to own a piece of the business or have some special requirements. The devil's always going to be in the details. And if you're thinking about doing this, let me encourage you to go on the cable channels and watch uh, the, the, uh, the program called Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Those individuals on there, they're fun to watch, and they're cool, and they, they, they'll share their thought processes with you. They are all about buying a business and ending up with a portion of it, uh, and that's what angel investors do. So look at that give it some thought. I'll tell you this. Up in Rocky Mount, uh, uh, I mean, Roanoke Rapids a few years ago, they had a, a person that had been coming to the seminars, developed their product, worked with the director there and went on Shark Tank and actually got their business funded with several millions of dollars. So as I watch angel investors, don't think this is just people from out of the world, not real folks, because we've seen some people right here in North Carolina from the SBA, uh, Small Business Center, end up there and getting their business funded. That was really exciting. Now, two words, investor and partner. It's important that you know that investors and partners are not the same thing. The investor is the person that uh, gives you some money to put into the business, and they expect you to get paid back on a certain date, certain amount of money, whatever that promissory note says. That's what they care about. They don't care. Well, they care, but they're not going to hear excuses about business is bad or slow or this or that. They just want their money to be paid back as you promised them to do it. 
and you need to do that. An investor, while they're doing this, have no right to tell you how to run your business. Sometimes they want to do that, but you have to up front stand your ground and say, no, 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 you are an investor. If I want some advice, I'll ask for it, but I am under no obligation to give you some type of power to run my business. A partner, on the other hand, is taking risks with you. And your agreement and understanding with partners may be a lot different. And in other words, they may want to put their shoulder to the wheel and do some work because they're going to take a loss if the business takes a loss, and they're going to take a gain if the business does well, not like the investor. They're going to be yes or no, depending on how the business is going. Again, both of these situations always get back to a well-documented arrangement on what the difference is, what's expected of each party. Documents are important. 51% is that percentage where you own control of the business. Anything less than 51%, anything less, and I'm not going to cut it down to 50.1%. Let's call it 51, okay? 51% gives you control. Anything less than that lets other people fire you, run you off, do what they want to with the assets of the business, have control. So you want to maintain 51% of your business if you can, any way you can, okay? I know that sometimes with father and son deals or mother-daughter or sister-sister, or just friends together. Uh, some people say, if it isn't 50-50, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to have less power than my partner who has the same amount of money as I do. Well, I know that's the human nature of folks, and people have a hard time saying, what if that's the way you feel about it? Then you just put in 49% of the money, and I'll put in 51%, and and uh, and, and and I'll have uh, I'll have the the uh, the majority. But sometimes people won't do that either. They want it to be 50-50 all the way, everything that's going on. If that's the case, I'm going to tell you right now, it will probably go south someday. Uh, some, somebody will die and someone will have a fuss and a fight and there will be an argument. But you'll get through it probably. Not be happy, maybe not in an equitable way, but you can get through it. There's two things that you can do to make this go a whole lot better if you have to have a 50-50 arrangement. <clears throat> Number one, and all this is in writing, I will not make you an offer that I'm not willing to take myself. Don't make me an offer to buy my share of the business that you wouldn't be willing to take yourself. Put that in writing. Take it to the courthouse and have it recorded. That keeps someone from taking advantage of someone else when they're down on their luck had a bad cash issue, and the partner that's still doing good, still got some money to spend, tries to take advantage of the partner that's having a bad time. So they might, let's say both of you have $20,000 in a business, but one partner is going through a bad time for whatever reason and really needs some money badly to pay some bills or whatever. So the partner who's got plenty of money says, okay, I got Ten thousand dollars I can offer you, but I, I want your share of the business. Well, ten thousand dollars is a lot of money, and we get this person out of the jam they're in. But after it's over with, they'd have nothing to show. They put twenty thousand dollars in the business, and they just lost uh, uh, ten thousand dollars cash because they're not getting paid but ten thousand for their percentage of the business. That's tough. I hate to see people taking advantage like that, but it happens. But if you had an agreement in writing that would prevent that, then you, the, the person that was hurting, could say, okay, you're offering me ten grand. Give me just a little bit to see what I can do with it. And in your document, you would have a timeline. That person could go out and find a friend or an investor or someone to help them, help them buy half of the business for $10,000, and, and indeed, you could own, end up uh, owning it in a lot better shape than you're in. And that person that made you that lowball offer, they're out, and they had to live with, with their offer. That's fair, and it keeps the waters calm. 
Number two, <clears throat> say to each other that you will not sell or not offer to sell any of the stock until you give your partner first option to buy it. That doesn't say that you're not going to sell it. It just says I'll give my partner first option to buy it and, 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 at, at, at the price that you plan on selling it at. That way, one partner doesn't end up with a partner he don't like or somebody new coming into business that doesn't think the same way you do. Some sorry son-in-law creeps in. Uh, divorces and marriages just split up businesses all the time. And you need some documented protection uh, to look after these things. Now, when you do your LLC or you get your corporation license started, that's a good time while you're sitting there talking to the lawyer about drawing us a, a legal document that covers these bases that I'm talking to. And your attorney may have some other advice as well. But remember, 50-50 arrangements need some backup documents to protect you in the long run. I got some good news for you. There's an excellent chance that what you need to get your business started, if it, it requires some big ticket items like trucks or cars or buses or trailers or tractors or backhoes or sewing machines or uh, plumbing tools or uh, pretty expensive items, the people that you are going to buy that stuff from maybe have in-house financing. And if that's the case, you want to check it out. They might ask you to pay a little down payment. Sometimes they don't. But when you can protect your bank finance and arrangements and, and have a line of credit at the bank that's available to you to use, then that's a good thing to use this outside financing so that you're able to grow your business with your banking arrangement and use these outside financing to, to uh, protect your cash flow. Remember, if you wait until you have all the money it takes to buy everything you need in some type of businesses, you won't ever get started. Sometimes, sometimes we have to go into debt. And as long as that debt is paying its own way, that item that you're buying and borrowing money on is paying its own way, it's okay. You just want to make sure that you, that you uh, check it out and make sure it's going to pay for itself. And then... You don't want to pay off long-term debt too quick because you'll use up your short-term cash flow if you do that. Just if, you got some, if you're able to build up some money, then I'll put it in a reserve account because you'll use that to, uh, to uh, pay for unexpected bills, uh, to uh, take advantage of good opportunities where you can buy stuff below fair market value. Another way to help your cash flow as you get into business is do pre-sales. That is, uh, uh, this is thin ice now because uh, we trust because you have to know that you can back up what you're doing. But having pre-sales, having customers pay you in advance for something before it comes in is a way you can have money to operate and to use provided you do it very, very carefully. Lots of folks do this in business. They take advance orders on things, get paid up front. That helps them buy the materials cover their costs, uh, not have to borrow money from outside sources. And basically, what does the person that's loaning you the money get? Maybe it's a real good cash price. It's a guaranteed delivery date. Maybe you'll do the assembly and delivery. You'll offer some value-added things to make them want to trust you to give you the money in advance. Now, you've got to be worth that trust and, 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 and be able to manage uh, those assets very carefully. But in the long run, that can go a long, long way to help you get started. After you're open and up and running and things are going along quite well, we have to be concerned about cash flow daily, every day. We have to be concerned about it. We have to be pigeonholing money to pay our taxes that we haven't paid yet. Uh, because sometimes we'll uh, have a big sale, take in a lot of tax money, uh, before the month's over, we've had some things that we've spent that money on, and now the taxes are due, and you're in trouble. And let me tell you, you're in trouble, and you're out of business because the tax people will come and lock your doors. They will shut you down. And once you're shut down, it's really hard to get up and run it again. But watch your cash flow. If you see that 
that you just aren't getting ahead, you just under too much stress, then add some profit centers. Remember, add some profit centers that people need. People need as much more so than what people want, because those profit centers that people need will bring folks in on a regular basis and help your regular cash flow. Let's grow the business. Let's grow the business. Let's look at how many DBAs we can add, how many targeted customer groups we can add to enjoy having business year-round, all 12 months, uh, so that we're not going through such tight times that we end up having to borrow money. Now, you and I both know that little problems, a little hole in the dam can cause a big flood. We have to stay on top of our little crises. And this is, this is hard to do. Remember those priorities that I've talked about before, setting priorities? Way down the list sometimes will be, let's look after little crises. We've well, got to tell you that we need to move that up on the list as far as we can so that we take care of the little crises before they come big explosions. Because they eventually will. If we keep letting a little leak of money go by or somebody get behind and more behind and more behind, or they keep ordering from you and they keep asking for more discounts to the point that you're not making any money, then that's going to hurt you in the long term. So try to recognize little crises and fight them as soon as you can. It's a big, big deal. Let's look at seven ways to maybe help you get some cash going on right now. Number one is to remember not to stock more stuff than you can sell in a reasonable period of time. I don't want you to have a great big warehouse full of stuff that's not selling. Order in what you need to have a basket you can sell out of, but don't order in any more than what it takes. Don't tie your good money up in stuff that's not able to turn. The key word to remember is turnover. You want to have good turnovers, rolling your stock over as fast as you can. I'm in a beautiful business now where that I don't have to stock anything in my business. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those direct shippers. I take an order in, the customer pays me, I call up the distributor, we ship it to the customer. I'm paid, the distributor's paid, no credit involved, no inventory. And lots of times I can start, I can take orders in advance and collect money like I talked about earlier. I wait, it'd be three, four, five, or six months sometimes before their product comes in, uh, and, and so I'm able to use that money until it does come in, which helps me out a lot. When you can do things in your business that allow you to do that, it will help you. Number two, look for, for, for places that you're just wasting money, and we all have those places. I have them. Uh, I'm procrastinating about uh, plugging up a few holes uh, just because of the, the uh, amount of work and time it takes to make it happen, but we need to do it. We especially need to do it if we're finding ourselves being tight for cash. Uh, we figure out how to stretch those dollars out by cutting costs. And kind of like when we were raising money, we go out and we do that magic act, which is turn old assets into new dollars. Turn old assets into new dollars. One thing that you can do, maybe you have uh, in your business uh, 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 forklifts or trucks or cars or things like that, some assets that are still worth a lot of money, but there's nothing owed on them, and you need to create some cash to do some business with. Well, you can always consider refinancing items. Something you already own, you can go to your lender and say, I want to, I want to, uh, uh, to refine, I want to buy this. Uh, I want you to give me uh, money on it and use it for collateral. There's nothing wrong with using an asset you've got for collateral to generate new cash. Uh, uh, that is a good way to do it. Basically, uh, you know what it's worth. You still got control of it. You just want to make sure that you can make the payments and it's going to pay for itself, that it's a good business move. This is one of these situations. All three of these items here are where connecting the dots making decisions that make good sense uh, for a business help you in, uh, in ways that you're controlling uh, uh, your cash flow in your business. Add profit centers again. 
new revenue sources that can help build up sales. New revenue sources that you can use as up sales after you say, and by the way, those are the revenue sources you want to add. Really use your mind power to find these and use it because by the way is the best way for you to stack profits and improve cash flow. Now, reach out to your Raven fan customers. I've been saying this now, and I'm going to ask all of you, have you got that database started? Have you got your email list started so that you can start reaching out to your Raven fan customers? Because if you're not, you're going to be so amazed with how much new business that will generate for you. Timely promotions go a long, long way. Now, a word of caution here. Maybe you've got credit cards or bank lines that you could use, but because you're afraid of being in debt so much, you just don't want to use them. That's a mistake. You should use your credit cards. You should use your credit lines uh, a little bit several times a year. Very small amount of loans or large amount of loans for a short time. If you don't use those credit lines and credit cards, you will lose them. And having them there as an asset, in case you get in a bind or have an opportunity to make a big move that help your business, can be very important for you. So uh, use your credit lines. If you don't use them, you'll lose them. With local banks, stay in touch with the president. Be and see, uh, be and uh, be seen, uh, and, and see these people yourself. Know who the folks are in your bank that can make a difference when you do need a loan because you don't want to wait and start a relationship on the day you need the money. The relationships need to be started ahead of time. So remember, it's the bank, the, bank, the board of directors, the uh, other folks there in the bank. Know their names. Make sure they know your names because, again, I'll remember, remind you, it's who you know not what you know that will help you cash flow your business when you need to. Again, a caution, do not pay off your uh, long-term debts with short-term money. Uh, if you are behind and having trouble making payments, I suggest to you that you use this strategy. When that payment comes in, that, that bill comes in, if it's got a minimum pay amount, even if you can't pay the whole amount, Go ahead, write that same day, write a check or send in the minimum payment. Send it in right away because making the payment early or really quick like that will help your credit standard. Also, write a note if you're not paying it all off when you think you can pay it off or to make sure they're okay with you making incremental payments. Stay in touch with them. What you don't want to do is to run away from or avoid speaking to or, or, or not answering phone calls, letters, or emails from people you owe money to. You're a lot better off to stay in touch with them, pay the small amount that you can, and move on. Now, in bills that are related to hospital bills, medical bills, things like that, some of them can be astronomical. I know that. I see them myself. But I want you to know that usually, and I hadn't found a, an exception to this, Usually those hospitals will indeed uh, take up to as much as a $50 a month or a $100 a month payment on a $100,000 bill and not be, calling you cash, uh, not be calling you past you or adding finance charges on it. So if you have a, those big type bills that are really hurting you and you're afraid, afraid that might sh shut you down or send you into bankruptcy, then I want you to call that institution Tell them what type of, see what type of arrangements that you can make on the ridiculously low amount per month. Well, as long as they'll go for it, you can pay extra when you want to, but lots of times that'll keep them from putting you on a, a, a bad credit list. Also, when you're borrowing money and you just, uh, uh, for uh, short term projects, uh, and you're working with the bank or private investors, they really like to work with what we call a, a uh, a balloon payment, payable in 12 months. In other words, you don't have to make monthly payments. But a good way to get someone to do that for you is for you to pay the interest in advance. Yeah, here's the way you would do that. You, it's called an interest advance loan. And let's say that you need 
a thousand dollars, you actually need nine hundred dollars, and you're going to do a ten percent loan. So you go to the bank and you would borrow a thousand dollars, take a hundred dollars out of that thousand, pay it right back to the bank to prepay the interest, and then you don't have to make those payments for a year. Now you want to set aside money and, and make sure you can pay it off when you're supposed to. But the banker will love that because they have got their interest up front and a, a good secure loan on the long term. People who do this do it a lot for special needs and, and, and projects. So keep that in mind. It's a good, good, good way that angel investors like to work as well. I want to tell you that I want you to have an era like this in your business where that you've got cash flow going up, where that you've got asset values going up where you got raving fan customer numbers going up, where you got new profit centers raising your cash flow. I like these areas that add up, and I want you to have a bunch of them in your business. Now, COVID has made an impact on all of us and continues to make a big impact. Uh, hopefully, the worst of it is over with. But today, I found out that a good friend of mine is, is uh, in serious condition with COVID down in Wilmington. So let's keep this in mind as we run our businesses. And it will teach us to add marketable profit centers. Keep selling. Sell yourself. Uh, keep moving to do what you can. Maybe you can turn a hobby into a business. Maybe you've got something doing right now that you're good at that you can look at that and say, you know, I can make that a profit center in my business and bring in some extra money. Anything related to, to pets is a good thing in today's world. I said anything, pretty much everything. So think about where your interest may be. Think about some things that you might want to do uh, related to, to different pets and such as that uh, uh, to, to, to bring it forward. Uh, Vanessa, I bet you can come up with some type of special coin uh, related to pets. If you got something going on, let us know. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, think about how that might work. Uh, to, Today in our neighborhood, I saw somebody coming by uh, grooming animals that in, had a van. Uh, they were uh, giving uh, uh, dog grooming and cutting and washing and drying their hair uh, right here in the neighborhood. They do one place, pull down the street, get another place, go around the corner, do another. I imagine that probably about $50 a clip and making about six stops right here in our neighborhood in half the morning, they picked up three to $400. So... I know that cash is being spent. Some other folks down in the Seven Springs area, uh, he's been doing this for years, takes his chainsaw and his artist and does, uh, does figurines for, uh, for different people and statues. Uh, private label foods is a good way to create extra profit and, and cash flow in your business. There's a co-packer in Elizabethtown I'll be glad to hook you up with. Got over 200 different food items that you can put your label on if you want to. Or if you've got a special recipe that you're proud of, they'll cook your recipe and help you market it. Big, big profitability. Some folks with lifestyle exercises, yoga, and some other things have classes, make extra money. Uh, the folks that I like to cook and do uh, health food diets, they're uh, serving people, bringing in some extra cash. But whatever it is, the key to turn it from a feel-good thing to something making money is going to be sending out the promotions, sending out promotions at least on a monthly basis to your database and to your raving fan customers. That's what will bring in the cash flow for you, and that's why I'm so happy to mention it to you. Having that list of targeted customers that we talked about last week, have you been working on that? You've been working on targeted customers? so that we can determine how we're going to market to them and save a lot of money by doing so. The targeted customers are more important than the rest of the world. Remember, we can't be all things to all people, but we must be everything to some people. That way we're going to create a lot of raving fan customers who we're going to be able to say, and by the way, not only do we have this, but we've got these other uh, marketing uh, uh, profit centers. So let's, let's do a lot of business instead of just a little bit. Maybe you're stuck in the mud. Maybe you just can't find or have the customers come to you with that cash flow. Well, indeed, maybe it's time that you hit the road and go mobile. It might be a, a trailer. It might be a food truck. It might be a display van. 
uh, it, uh, it might be pop-ups, uh, going to pop-ups, uh, uh, events, but take it on the road if that's what you need to do. The key to that is, is when you get out there and you're set up to have items that will bring people right on in. A good variety of, of, of bring people, profit centers, number one, uh, displays, uh, things that may or may not be related, but for that season, it will bring people over. And once they get there, they'll be buying the other stuff that you're offering as well. Let's bring it on in here uh, for, for a landing. Or you don't get up off the seat and stop being a spectator? Well, when you're ready, we're ready to help you. Be the player. You don't make some mistakes. You'll knock some home runs and you'll strike out. The key is, is we're going to do these little things and hit a lot of base hits. Do a lot of things right and things will, get, will be good for you. So let's get in the game together. Next week, I want to tell you that we're going to talk about basic bookkeeping. I'm not a bookkeeper or accountant, as I tell you all the time, but there are some certain things in the bookkeeping information that will come back to us that are very, very important in helping us run our business and know how we're going to make some more money. In addition to that, and just as importantly, next week we're going to talk about forecasting and we're going to talk about negotiating. Really three important parts of the business. So uh, it's not as uh, uh, out in the public as the marketing stuff we've talked about here before, but just as important for your long-term well-being in business, bookkeeping, negotiating, and forecasting, and uh, looking forward to that. Later on, after this series is over, in I think week 10 or 11, we'll have some, some hard-hitting uh, focal points on those skills as well. So don't ever think that everything is just fine. Stay on your toes. Uh, it, be a friend of the Small Business Center. Stay in touch with them. Look for new selling opportunities to help you cash flow. Fight distractions, set priorities, and maintain high standards always. And being the best person you can be will help people want to do business with you. Light your candle and let it shine. Let it shine, shine, shine. Uh, be, be the kind of person that you're proud of and your family be proud of. You got to believe and trust in yourself, as I believe and trust in you guys, and you can do it. You can do it at your pace, and let's just keep trying to do that. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing y'all next week. Our next uh, presentations will be next Wednesday and Thursday nights, and you'll certainly be welcome to join us. I'm going to now uh, stop sharing the screen and. Turn it on the mics. All right, everybody. How do, what do you think? That was, that was some really good information, even though I missed some of it. Well, I appreciate that, Ed, and we'll be, I'll be able to send you a, uh, a videotape tomorrow uh, so you can go back and pick it up and review it if you want to. And uh, stop. Yeah, stop the slides where you want to, make notes, and uh, uh, do that. It helps a lot of people, and I'm glad to share that with you. Okay, thank you so much. You're very welcome, and hope you all have a good night. Any other comments from anyone? I enjoy myself. I have a lot of good information, and... I do have some of the things crossed off on my homework list. I just need to get it together and send it to you. All right. Well, I'm proud of you, Tisha. I'm looking forward to getting that. Okay. I'm going to be working on the new quiz uh, uh, this coming week so I can start sharing with you all. And, of course, when I send you the quiz, I'll send you the answers. So we'll, everybody's going to make 100, but uh, well, I want you to have a chance to uh, write them down. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. And you as well. All right, I hope. Thank you very much, Sarita. I appreciate you being with us again for sure. I hope y'all have a great, a great, great weekend. And uh, if you have questions, send me a, send me an email. We'll try to help you through them. Okay. Good night.
All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.